Welcome back, your friendly neighborhood sports science doctor, here again with Wolf Coaching, Dr. Milo Wolf. Today, we're reacting to someone's advice that I've actually collaborated with before, and that's the Jeremy Ethier. Jeremy Ethier is a huge proponent of using science to inform your training and nutrition practices. And so, without being biased today, I'm gonna to try and react to one of his videos to see whether or not it actually holds up to the science that he claims he's using. Without further ado, let's get into it. If you want to actually get lean this year, the odds are stacked against you. More than 80% of people who try end up failing. But there's three simple science-backed steps that have helped me and several others beat the odds and get leaner than ever. Before I show you the first step, your diet, let's quickly create a realistic timeline for you. He is actually correct about most people struggling to lose weight. And this is actually why nowadays for my clients, I'm less inclined to have them gain weight intentionally on the bulk. When you combine the fact that bulking doesn't really increase your muscle growth by that much, and I have a whole video on this here, you can check it out. When you combine that fact with the idea that most people really struggle to lose weight, for a lot of more general population clients who just want to gain some muscle and look better over the long term, bulking weight that they'd have to lose again in the future you know, not every gram that you gain during a bulk is going to be muscle. And so you will have to lose fat at some point. Going on a specific bulk likely actually hinders them in the long term where they're going to struggle to lose that weight. They're going to struggle to keep that weight off. And so sometimes for their health in the long term, staying at maintenance is a better approach. But yes, absolutely agree with Jeremy here. It is very common for participants in research and just generally people in real life to struggle to lose that much weight. It's not just hard losing that weight. It's actually also hard to keep it off. But let's continue. Take a look at the following photos. Pick the one that best matches your current body. Now to get to around 12% body fat with good ab definition, this is roughly how long it would take. Whereas to get a little less lean around 15%, this is how long it would take. Now this might be longer than you expected, but most people highly underestimate just how much fat they have to lose and how long it takes to do so. For example, in these two photos, I lost roughly 20 pounds in about 14 weeks. But I also followed the plan I'm about to share with you almost perfectly, which just isn't realistic for most people. So expect it to take longer than you think. But as long as you keep trying and trusting the process I'm about to share with you, you will succeed. Your diet is without a doubt what's going to drive most of your results. And it does this by forcing your body to use fat for energy. But this can only be done by creating a calorie deficit, where you're eating fewer calories than your body needs every day. Now to find the right calorie deficit for your body, you can use the calculator we've made over at builtwithscience.com slash calculator, which I'll also link below. But to actually hit this target, you need to first fix your food environment. For example, I personally just would not be able to walk past cookies at home every day and not end up eventually eating them. So set yourself up for success by throwing away your trigger foods and taking advantage of your laziness by placing your high calorie snacks and treats in hard to reach places. This also applies to healthy snacks like nuts and granola. I agree with Jeremy wholeheartedly. Huh? There's actually a fair bit of behavioral psychology when it comes to dieting that people should be made more aware of. Specifically, some of this, to my knowledge, is summarized in the book Atomic Habits by James Cliff, which I recommend it is actually in the background somewhere over there. It summarizes some of the behavioral psychology that goes into promoting weight loss. Specifically, things like excluding certain foods that are high in calories from your kitchen. Placing foods that you should be consuming that promote satiation. You know, things like fruit and vegetables in easy to spot places. All of those things, designing your environment in a way that is conducive to weight loss is going to be one of the biggest things you can do to promote your successful diet. Anything you can easily overeat should be out of sight or hard to access. Also, Pay attention to what you're doing when you eat. Some research has shown that one of the strongest predictors of being overweight was eating meals in front of the TV. So when you do eat, try to shut everything down and just be present. But after fixing your food environment, what foods should you actually include in your diet? To my knowledge, there is actually some research around something we call mindful eating, which is essentially focusing on the experience of eating as you're eating, and also on slowing down the rate of eating. For example, using a smaller spoon or chopsticks as a means to slow down the rate of eating, and both of those having positive impacts on satiation, hunger levels, and potentially on weight loss. So again, by and large, I agree with him here. Well, let's start with what seems to be the most powerful food for fat loss, protein. By providing your body with enough protein, you're protecting your muscles from being burned off for energy during a diet. This forces your body to burn off more of your fat instead. As per how much protein to eat, 
Research typically shows the greatest benefit when protein is increased to about 0.8 grams per pound of your body weight per day. So if you weigh 180 pounds, you'd aim to eat around 140 grams of protein per day. Now here's what 30 grams of protein actually looks like from high quality sources. Pick one of these to have with each of your meals and you should be able to hit your daily target. His advice here is spot on once again. This fits right in with the meta regression that I frequently cite by Morton and colleagues that shows that around 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day optimizes fat free mass gains when coupled with actually lifting. Additionally, the example he gave offhand of consuming four meals a day, that will likely be sufficient to optimize muscle protein synthesis and thus retain as much muscle as possible. So overall, yet again, a very solid advice. Now, in addition to protein, there's a handful of other foods that can have a powerful effect on your fat loss. Back in 1995, a team of researchers ranked 38 different foods based on how well they kept people full after a meal. Potatoes, oats, whole grains, lean proteins, apples, and oranges all ranked extremely well. Whereas higher processed foods like white rice, cereal, chips, candies, and pastries all ranked poorly. So what I'd suggest is 80% of the time, try to eat more of these highly filling, nutritious foods. Eat plenty of vegetables as well since they'll fill you up for less calories. And then 20% of the time, allow yourself to eat treats and more processed foods that although won't fill you up as much will help you avoid an overly restrictive mindset i think an 80 20 rule is a great place to start but it's worth mentioning that this isn't some sort of science-based rule or that everyone should follow exactly 80 20 it's more like a general principle to live by for example the closer you get to actually stepping on stage as a bodybuilder getting really lean into those low body fat percentages at that point, you won't be living by the 80-20 rule in all likelihood anymore. You'll actually be living mostly by the 100-0 rule because you have to pull out all the stops just to stay full and maintain your diet. Equally, if you're very overweight, you might find that you can lose weight just fine with the 60-40 approach, wherein 60% of your diet is mostly unprocessed foods and 40% of it is more processed. The important thing, and I'm not sure he's going to touch on this in the video much or if it's just sort of keeping things simple, is that it's not just how processed the food is, but it's specifically a few things. One, caloric density. The more calorie dense a food is, the more calories it has per given gram of food or per given volume of food, and the less fiber it has, generally the less satiating and the less it's going to impact your hunger in a positive way. So generally, during dieting, not only do you want to pick mostly unprocessed foods, but you specifically want to pick foods that have low calorie density, so they have few calories for every bite, and they have a lot of fiber, as both of those things will promote satiation and reduce hunger. Ultimately, for many diets, hunger is a big issue. So if you can follow these things, you'll set yourself up for success. And if you're wondering what this looks like as a full day of eating, it could be something like protein pancakes for breakfast, salmon and potatoes for lunch, chicken and veggies for dinner, and Greek yogurt with fruit for dessert. All of this comes up to just 2100 calories. And at the end of the video, I'll leave a link to this exact meal plan. So Incorporating what we've talked about so far should increase the odds that you're eating in a calorie deficit. But many people still end up eating too many calories despite following a healthy diet. So as a final note for your diet, I'd highly recommend actually tracking your calories and seeing if you're on target. Even if it's just for a week, it'll help you at least be aware of whether you need to adjust anything. I fully agree with this. And there is actually some research suggesting that people who log and monitor their food consumption more consistently, and for example, their weigh-in as well, their body weight day-to-day -day as measured by a scale, they generally see greater dietary success in whatever their goal is. Likewise, most people who say they can't lose weight on a given calorie intake that seems very low, like 1200 calories or what have you, generally just aren't tracking everything that they're consuming, and they're underestimating how many calories they're consuming. So when you are tracking your calories, try and be as precise as possible. So we've got your diet covered, but what are the best exercises to help you get leaner? Well, luckily for us, a recent meta-analysis ranks several different fat loss protocols from most to least effective. A calorie deficit plus lifting weights was the most effective method. Now, the reason lifting weights is great for fat loss is similar to why eating more protein helps with fat loss. Lifting weights tells your body to keep your muscle and burn fat for energy instead. So use your diet to do the hard work of creating most of your calorie deficit, but lift weights three to five times per week to make sure you're losing fat 
not muscle. I agree with him here, and I'm happy he didn't go the route of, well, when you lift weights, you actually grow muscle and you turn into some sort of metabolic furnace. Because in reality, that isn't actually what happens. In fact, gaining a kilogram of muscle can often only result in an additional like 20 calories burned per day, if that. So it's not as though lifting will make you this energy burning machine, right? Where all of a sudden your maintenance calories jump up by a ton. However, lifting weights is by far the biggest factor in maintaining your muscle. You can eat as much protein as you want. If you're not lifting weights consistently, and you're losing a bunch of weight, a lot of that will be muscle loss. But this doesn't mean you hit the gym and then sloth around the rest of the day. One of the reasons why people fail to get lean during a diet is because they subconsciously get lazier and reduce the number of steps they take as they get leaner and leaner. To avoid this, start tracking your daily steps. Try to build up to at least 7,000 steps per day and keep that consistent throughout your diet. He's completely on point here. And I think there's a few things he didn't mention. One, when you're dieting and you're no longer seeing weight loss, there's a couple of levers I would typically pull on. One is just eating less food, consuming fewer calories. That is one way of increasing your calorie deficit and burning more fat. Two, however, is to simply increase the number of steps. There are diminishing returns, however. There's something called the additive model of energy expenditure and something called the constrained model of energy expenditure. In the additive model, Every thousand step increase, for example, leads to a consistent linear increase in how much energy is burnt. In the constrained energy model, however, you see that as you add more and more steps, you get diminishing returns on how many additional calories you're burning. And so if you go from say zero to 8,000 steps, that might lead to 300 calories burned. But if you go from eight to 16,000 steps, that might only lead to 200 calories burnt. So you get diminishing returns on activity. And so if your weight loss comes to a halt, Generally, I would opt to decrease the amount of calories you're consuming unless your number of steps is relatively low. The highest I'll typically have someone go in terms of number of steps is up to 15,000 steps per day. This can be individualized a little bit, however. For example, if you're someone who gets really hungry, but in terms of energy, you're fine during a weight loss phase. You may find that increasing your steps is a good approach because you can still eat just as much food but you end up in a bigger deficit and your energy isn't really an issue in the first place. And vice versa, if you're someone who's not really ever hungry during weight loss phase, but your energy goes way down and you don't have the time to do those additional steps, then you might find that reducing the amount of calories you consume day to day is a better approach. Finally, the reason I like to have these two levers as opposed to having a bunch of cardio sessions within your program to promote energy expenditure and get you into a bigger deficit for weight loss is because doing steps going on walks is really not that fatiguing on the whole. So it actually combines very well with lifting in the gym. It's not gonna tire you out a bunch before you lift. Apply everything we went through so far and you should be able to lose about one to two pounds of fat per week. Repeat that for several weeks and eventually you'll be at your goal body fat percentage. But we all know that's much easier said than done. Eating healthy, tracking your calories, doing your workouts and getting enough steps every single day can get overwhelming. But there's three consistency hacks that I found make people far more likely to stick it through and succeed. The first is what I like to call the power of 60%. One study compared those who tracked their calories at least 60% of the time, those who tracked less than 30% of the time, and those who tracked inconsistently. So maybe 100% on some weeks, but less than 30% on other weeks. Can you guess which group lost the most fat? Yep, the 60% group. So instead of aiming for perfection, just aim to hit your goals at least 60% of the time. And if you look at this on a weekly basis, that's just four or five days out of the week. Only once that becomes easy, should you then aim for more. Now as for the second consistency hack, let's say you were going on a road trip across the country. What would happen if you tried to do the drive all in one go? While you might start off strong, eventually you'd burn out and run out of gas. The same is true with dieting. As much as we want to get to the end destination as quickly as possible, we need to take breaks every now and then to recharge. In the fitness world, this is what's known as diet breaks. It's a week or two where you increase your calorie intake to around 500 calories more than when you were dieting. While it's not a free pass to eat whatever you want, it will give you more flexibility with your food choices and can help you recharge both mentally and physically before your next dieting phase. 
As for how often to do them, typically after every 8 to 12 weeks of consistent dieting is when I highly recommend considering one. I completely agree with Jeremy here on the value of diet breaks or refeeds. In fact, there was a recent meta-analysis on the topic that I'll post up on the screen now, showing that generally diet breaks, refeeds and the like are beneficial when it comes to managing hunger and promoting weight loss during a diet. Now, the last consistency tip I have has to do with your belly fat. Most people, if after six weeks of dieting, they see no change in their belly, they assume it's not working and they quit. But your body saves the best for last. Usually, your body will start by losing fat around your chest, shoulders, arms, back, and even your face. Only once it's lost enough fat from those areas will it start to make its way down to your upper stomach area and then finally your lower belly fat. Unfortunately, there's no way to specifically target these areas. The real secret is just sticking it out for longer. Here's an example from one of our Built With Science members, Jesse, who stuck to his plan for a year. Notice how there's not much difference in his belly in the first three months. Month eight, however, is when you can really start to see some big changes in his belly. Now, this wasn't from him changing anything. It was from him simply trusting the process and sticking to the plan. Here's another example from Archie, who ran our program for 10 months. His face, chest, and shoulders were all the first areas to improve. But just imagine if he quit after month four because he wasn't seeing much progress in his belly fat. Here's another one from Tamara, after just eight months of simply sticking to the plan. Remember, you have a lot more fat to lose than you think. So until you get lean enough to notice your belly fat coming off, be proud of the fat loss progress you've made in your face, arms, chest, and shoulders. Just don't quit right before the going gets good. So I actually slightly disagree with Jeremy here on this last point. To my knowledge, while there are differences in body fat distribution, for example, between males and females, there's not much evidence on how fat is lost during a diet, say from 20% to 10% body fat. And I think there's going to be substantial individual differences, right? Personally, for example, when I diet, my abs get lean relatively quickly and I have decent abs, but other areas don't. And I think there's some degree of individual variation here. And I would be hard pressed to say I've seen much evidence suggesting that this pattern is consistent amongst both men and women for example anyways that is the whole video reviewed honestly this was pretty good like for an eight minute video ultimately aimed at more of a general population that wanted to lose weight or what have you this is really solid i would give it like a, a nine out of ten in terms of information being delivered i'm like sure there are certain things where more nuance could have been given or what have you but equally this is an eight minute video geared towards general population so i don't really have any major qualms with it it's really solid so Jeremy is here, you get a thumbs up. That's been the video. If you enjoyed the video, please consider commenting, liking, and subscribing. If there's anyone else you want me to react to, please leave a comment down below and I'll get to them. But anyways, I will see you guys, my subscribers, next time. Have a good day. Peace.